Okay, so Guy, I am so happy to be here with you and just want to remind you of how meaningful it is for me to have connected with you and to be able to call you a friend of mine as well. And I do want to share quickly how we met. Um, so I had done a video conversation with Tim Freak, um, which basically was kind of critiquing the either or non-dual view that looks at the world as just an illusion um, and reduces all form back into formlessness and essentially looks at reality as not inherently real. Um, so somebody had commented on that and asked if I knew Guy Smith and I said no. So I went to your website and I saw that you were a somatic psychotherapist, but you had written several blog posts and you had written quite a few really insightful things about Neo Advaita, which is something that I had been a part of myself. Um, and I want to read the sentence that initially grabbed me. I can pull it up. Okay, here we go. So you wrote regarding Neo Advaita, while initially finding their free floating, infinitely empty, depersonalized perception as profound, they had eventually come to find it gnawingly devoid, numbly disconnected, and generally alienating. And then they longed instead to come into their bodies, become personal and real, to feel and live as concrete fleshly beings. And that just really touched me because I had experienced a very, very similar thing. Um, and then I reached out to you and found out that you had personally um, experienced something similar and had actually written a couple, a couple books um, during your, the time that you were um, experiencing this. So do you want to say a little bit about that? I just kind of spieled right now, but if you want to <laughs> give your own yes, introduction. Yes. Or <laughs> no, just to say thanks for, um, thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, it's been, um, it's a real surprise actually to hear from you originally because um, it's a long time now since I was involved in the non dual scene, it was kind of back in 2005 and 2006. Yeah. And I was only there for a couple of years and then I started to find it something really problematic going on. Um, so I just kind of left really. I'd, I'd written a couple of books, one that was very much from the um, very mainstream but quite kind of like a radical side of non duality. Um, and then I wrote one a bit later that was already starting to like hint at the kind of criticisms, but I wasn't, they weren't very formulated yet. Mm -hmm. um, but then, uh, you know, a year or so on of just kind of making sense of things, I was um, way away from it. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just kind of like coming to terms with what it was all about, like from, mm -hmm. from my own perspective. Uh, which ironically is kind of not allowed when you're in non-duality, you can't have your own perspective because there's only one perspective. So right. to have that again was such a relief and, and um, to start to make sense of things on my own terms was, was really good. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, over the last kind of, well, it's, I guess it's nearly like 15, 15 years or so since that time, um, luckily just by word of mouth, you know, lots of people have kind of approached me for kind of, help from a non-dual background uh, yeah people just kind of having all kinds of difficulties and that's just allowed me more and more to kind of um, yeah just to get more clear about what's going on and, and, and what's happening mm -hmm. um, and then to get your email was just like really refreshing because um, I found what you were saying in the email and then I checked out your website very very similar and I found it very interesting that we had had no connection yeah. Um, we don't have share a shared background apart from our involvement in, in Neo Advaita, and yet we were had very, very similar kind of mm. um, ways of understanding it. So, um, yeah, it was very, very exciting. So, thanks for reaching out, and um, yeah, looking forward to today. Yeah, I, I just really relate to all of that, especially what you said about um, starting to kind of come into your own perspective about things yeah. and about non-duality and how that wasn't really um, something that was super welcomed. And for me at least, like realizing how much of, of what I had been, I guess, 
hearing and being told in these teachings were actually very dogmatic. Um, <laughs> it's very dogmatic yeah. in so many ways because, you know, it's in the way it's delivered, it's dogmatic because it's like, this is the truth. So there's no room for anybody to say, actually, that's not how I see things. Or you can say it, but you, you're kind of like reduced to a, a noise, really, because how can it be true? It's already been shown that something else is the case. Yeah. Um, and what that truth says is there's there's no self, there's no you, there's no choice, there's no perspective really. There's just so there's no room within that to for any kind of difference or being really like to be in the sense of um, to have your own sense of things. That's yeah. gone, and while that feels quite liberating to some people because you kind of get rid of all that sense of um, cluster involved in having a personal sense of things um it's like a giant prison in some ways yes yeah. it's just locked into this view and there seems like there's no way out yeah um, when you said in the prison do you mean the the prison of the neo-advaita dogma or do you mean the prison of self that you kind of initially get no so, so, so in in neo-advaita dogma self is characterized as a prison uh, i yeah um and, and I could sort of relate to that as I think a lot of people probably do. Coming into it, a lot of people have quite a unpleasant sense of themselves. But I think the reason they have that problematic sense of self is because they're kind of plagued by a kind of like, in a sense, a kind of inner God, that kind of inner critic that just kind of comes in and keeps stifling you whenever you kind of have an original idea or a kind of feeling or a desire and it kind of like brings you up short. And in a way, I think non-duality like massively bolsters that mm. by, by kind of really like giving, it really kind of gives that the material to totally dismantle any sense of yourself or your, your, your kind of body or your, your, you know, having any sense of kind of volition or power in life. Or, so for me, that's a massive prison, but it's, it's so confusing because the terms are kind of inverse what I have kind of internalized in the, uh, yeah non-duality or western non-duality or whatever term we give to it neo advaita yeah yeah i guess that maybe is a, a good point to to pause and like clarify when we say non-duality because i think what's what i realized very much is that um what i had been thinking was non like the non-duality or non-duality was uh just this set of teachings of you know uh, there is no you, the world is just an illusion, there is no separate self, and in order to be free from suffering, you essentially need to um, dissolve that, that illusion and become, let's say, pure awareness. So I guess what I wanted to say is that what I realized is that it's one non-dual philosophy and a set of teachings based on that philosophy that point to a specific experience but that there's lots of different types of what I would say like non-dualisms, right? Like you have non-duality in Sufism and Kabbalah and Christian mysticism. And even within Eastern traditions, there's different, um, different kind of nuances to that. Um, so at least for me, and I think you and I are relatively aligned on that, the, the kind of modern popular um, non-dual teachings in the West seem to be um, very much sort of like a watered down version of Advaita Vedanta um, from Hinduism, just sort of taking that one teaching of self inquiry, right? Mm -hmm. Of who am I? Um, and then that sort of being the, the be all end all of, you know, there, there is no you, nothing is real. Again, this whole kind of derealization, depersonalization of the world. Um, but some of those non dual teachings in the West are more extreme than others. Um, yeah, I mean, the most extreme would, wouldn't even teach self-inquiry. And the, the kind that I was in was that self-inquiry would, you know, encourage a sense of self doing the self-inquiry so it, so that it, it would just be like, there's just, there's just no self, so there's nothing you can do. Sometimes that kind of disappears and then, and then you're seeing things as they are. Um, even to go, go doing that spiel, I can feel going into a headspace that I really hate now, but I thought was... Oh, heavenly when I when I first did it but it's um you're right it's, it's confusing whenever you've got like a word and there's like so many different people using it in so many different ways right um before we 
started, started this conversation we were trying to like settle on a particular term and it, it was really hard because I don't just want to like definitely my kind of critique is not just aimed at kind of really radical non-duality I think kind of softer versions of it are problematic maybe less in, in an intense way but more kind of insidiously so so it's still mm. it, I feel like it's less it sort of allows for a bit more of your being but um in a way that's a shame you you, wi you widen the shape of the thing that you're kind of trapped right. in it's it's um you maybe can can keep going with that a bit longer but it's still not a good place to be i don't think mm. um so an example of that would be um you know so i think like um radical non-duality would say um you know there's just what is so that and, and that's the end of it that whereas uh, maybe a softer version would say um there's just what is therefore you need to like accept what is so there's a little bit more sense of like a you kind of like um yeah. finding this way to just like accommodate to what is but to me again that that even in that you're going to kind of be excluding the the kind of the dynamic in you or the kind of force in you that that is maybe doesn't like how things are and wants to do things differently and i think that's uh really important part of humanity otherwise we'd just like be in this what is bubble and like accepting yeah. whatever and i think not accepting is super important and that's where self comes in so if you've already kind of outlawed self or you've you've already said it's a it's a it's an, an illusion then it's quite scary because you're kind of it's just excluded out of the picture but i think it goes on i think you can see plenty of signs of it in people who talk about it and people who are involved in it um mm -hmm. it's just kind of disowned yeah well i i think that um what you just said is maybe how i think of it is that there's the sort of a spectrum of how much reality is granted to let's say the self or the relative world of form and so for me there's like the rejection based non-duality that's you know we have an absolute and we have a relative um and the absolute is what's absolutely real and you know divides the relative and the absolute rather than seeing them as you know one in the same indivisible thing so very much based on rejecting things and exclusion yeah. rather than including everything in the in the wholeness of of oneness but i i know what you mean that disowning is a, a really good word because mm -hmm. i think maybe you and i have both felt that rather than actually getting rid of things it was more sort of an abandonment and i think a lot of people realize later that they've abandoned themselves or sort of exiled themselves thinking that they had you know been free of it and transcended it and mm -hmm. let's say dissolved it but that wasn't actually the case it's funny if you look at my first book there's uh there's a piece in it i it's i, I for kind of years i found my book like really excuse, excruciating and sometimes people even turn up to kind of the first like a first session with me with like my book there and i was like put that thing away um because because so much of it is is not me and it's, it's a weird thing to have had your mind taken over by a like a, a thing i think I, I think that's never a good thing and um retrospectively i can see that but when you're in it you don't know that you don't know that um but there's one passage but the thing i i i've learned to kind of like it a bit more the book although i don't recommend it for your health um it's a passage called like dead bodies within and i had this it was like about like a dream i had where i was talking to my dad and he said something like look to the dead bodies within and you know i was just trying to make sense of this dream for some reason it, it seemed quite powerful and then i kind of added to this piece kind of like a few weeks later because i was kind of out and i had this feeling of like a real like dry kind of rubbery gripping feeling in my body that felt very dead yeah. and i i think that i think that's what happens there's this like real deadening of your own kind of being um, when i talk about being now i i mean the same as kind of self i mean that kind of that intelligence that responsiveness that is personal but it's very um alive and rich and nothing like the way that self gets characterized in in well especially radical non-duality yeah um so and and i've seen this a lot people get real symptoms of like a real that i've become really dead and they're kind of like bedridden and 
people's digestion stops working, um, mm. they can't sleep very well, they just lose all kind of cycling. And to me, to me that makes sense because if you're just saying, if you've just kind of got isness, and isness isn't going anywhere, but our kind of, our bodies and our, our kind of, um, you know, biological dynamism uh, is always kind of like changing. So I think people just end up in this weird chamber that at first feels mm. all like free and clear and pristine, but actually it's, yeah, it's death. <laughs> and that's not hidden from non-dual kind of literature, you know, it's, I hope you die soon. And uh, <laughs> this kind of, uh, kind of thing. Yeah. And I'm um, like, I don't know, perhaps we don't want to go into, be, get too personal about it, but um, we're certainly aware of people who've taken their lives um, mm -hmm. from where they've got to. Um, and we can't say for sure what that's to do with, but there are some kind of troubling signs, certainly from what I've, from what I've read and seen of, of, of people in that situation. And it, it makes yeah. sense to me. It really makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I've, I mean, I've been hearing from these people as well since I've been starting to spread awareness about, let's say, the, the harmful aspects of um, a lot of the modern non-dual stuff, especially Neo Advaita and the, the radical side, but a lot of a lot of accounts of suicidality and even suicide. But I think one of the things that I thought of, because of course, you know, you could say that, well, that person was already, you know, kind of on the edge and it, you know, may, would have happened anyway. My feeling is that it's a bit more complex than that. But I think a lot of people who are really at the end of their rope will turn to teachings like this and hoping that that will solve the, you know, the extreme pain. And I think we can get, like, like I did, that initial amazing relief from such intense pain that it's just that boundlessness and that absence of self is just seems so healing and, you know, everything's going to be okay now because there's nobody here who's not okay. Um, but that I think a, people can go through that and then that kind of collapses and then they get to the dead end part and realize, you know, wait a minute, like all of this is still here and they're kind of back to square one. But then I think there's also people that just hear the messages um, and don't necessarily have a shift or have this awakening experiences. And what I thought about, I think it was actually earlier today, is that what can happen is that people maybe feel like they failed in their personal or like material life. And now they're trying to succeed in some spiritual attainment. And then when they don't attain that, it's like, well, fuck, I failed in my personal life. And now I failed in the spiritual world. I'm just done. And I've heard that from, from a lot of people as mm -hmm. well. So I think it does, it, it all ties in together. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously points to there being some really deeply problematic aspects to it. That's true. It's interesting. Um, it's interesting. I, it just it's a sort of like links to what you're saying, but a slightly different kind of point. Just uh, just relating to what you're saying about the that kind of real hunger for enlightenment and maybe like failure, feeling like you failed if you haven't kind of got there, or the kind of the torture of of this amazing promised land that you you kind of yeah. read about or has been insinuated. And often it's kind of downplayed, but then it's also like insinuated at the same time. So it's sort of like a <laughs> covering all bases, like, don't get disappointed. It's not that great, but it really is great. You know, you get sure. this kind of double messaging about it. Um, but I think that there's, I think that the radical non-duality has, has kind of tried to kind of do away with that, but it actually in, in, in many ways, I think it's kind of exacerbates it. So, it, you know, this is what I would have said is that you know, there's a lot of work, there's no path, there's no process, mm -hmm. any kind of like sense of like moving towards enlightenment would, would precipitate a like, continuous sense of duality, because you've got that over there and you're over here. Yeah. So there's no levels, there's no um, progress. And yeah, in a way, it's kind of doing away with a kind of a meritocratic version of non of kind of spirituality, where you you've got to kind of go through this long process of maybe mm -hmm. lifetimes of work and purification and kind of yeah. dedication. And I quite like that because I think 
I think that is another way to really like um, create a kind of sense of kind of inadequacy and insecurity and, and kind of I'm here and you're back there or I'm back there and they're way over here. But non-duality doesn't replace that with a lack of levels, even though it says that. I mean, radical, radical advaita. Um, sorry, I'm really mixing <laughs> mixing my non-duality terms now because okay. you know there's been no kind of subtle. Sorry. But it kind of replaces the meritocracy with a kind of aristocracy, whereas mm. it's just some people are fortunate to inherit this and others aren't. So there's these few kind of people slash non-people who have this perfect seeing and being and and everybody else is kind of ignorant asleep yeah. um it's just a massive duality in terms of what i i would call duality now sure and actually that's the source of the pain that people turn up with so it's yeah it's really paradoxical and i even think that goes back to traditional advaita because um the whole problem of the advaita was kind of came to address was this kind of duality of god and human Mm. And I think that that, I, I think possibly this is true of Advaita too, but I'm less qualified to talk about that. But certainly in terms of like the westernized version of non-duality, um, that just gets re reciprocated because you've got the guru who is all-knowing, all-seeing. Of course, they will say there's no guru, but that's just a cover-up yeah. too, because then you have nobody to scrutinize. And then everybody else is characterized as ignorant, confused, and it's such a patronizing viewpoint. You're really saying there's two different kinds of people in this world. Yep. And if you buy into it, then you're going to feel particularly inadequate. You're going to hope that you're going to finally reach this. Yeah. And the other alternative is you flip into the other one, and then you're kind of in this weird kind of like mountaintop state, and everybody else is down there, and that's no good for you either. Although it may feel lovely to start with, like, wow, this is gorgeous. Um, it's really weird and that's why I think freedom starts with the idea that everybody already has equal access to reality there's no kind of gradually inching your way up we're all here in this kind of forest of life and we can all engage with it and we shouldn't be kind of um, devaluing certain people's perceptions from the start and we shouldn't be elevating some people's because sure. then you lose all relationship you lose all kind of I don't know, it's just so freeing not to have to be high up or low down and just kind of talking. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, you mentioned something that, um, that stuck with me and I may have forgotten it now. Um, oh, right, so the, where you said there's sort of like this, they often make it seem as though they've left behind that progressive path, you know, or that attainment. Mm by saying, you know, it's already here, it's what already is, there's no path. Mm -hmm. So you have this idea of um, the end of seeking, mm -hmm. except what obviously happens is that people are seeking the end of seeking, right? So it's just the same exact thing where you're being told it's so obvious, you know, it's like, it's, it's nearer than near, it's nearer than your breath, you know, mm -hmm. stop seeking it outside, it's right here. But obviously that's not happening quickly or ever for a lot of people because they keep going back to these meetings and buying the books and listening to the same thing over and over again and not quite getting it yeah so i think that's also there's some like mind fuckery there you know of yeah, like, I think it's a con. I think it's like a conscious con i don't think i don't think people are sitting around going haha this is going to make me lots of money or but i i do think it is it's a real problem um and it, there is this massive power duality built into that but it has the illusion of not being because I think well it's just there it's, you can just see it yeah um, another version of that is where it's very commonly said this is more perhaps less radical non-duality is slightly more the wider kind of contemporary spiritual scene of like you have to find it out for yourself which mm -hmm. seems quite autonomous and quite kind of egalitarian but it's not really because you it means that the guru's already found it out yeah and you haven't and you have to find out exactly the same thing that the gurus found out for it to be valid. Otherwise, you're, you need to keep going and going and going. Um, again, I just see no sign of freedom in any of that. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Freedom is you, me, anybody else has the capacity to see and feel and respond and share how we perceive things. Why, why create this 
you know, it just, to me, it's kind of a different version of like monarchy or something. It's kind of a mm. um, hierarchy. And that is really kind of makes you kind of inadequate and also makes you addicted because you, you really feel like you need to get to the, get to this promised land. That's, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's right here. And yet it's not right here. Because right, right. Yeah. You have this sort of, uh, you know, also like it's effortless, but then you have the efforting to be effortless, which is yeah. a huge a huge blind spot but yeah also what you said about um you know you're being told what the reality is and right. then being told but go see for yourself yeah. basically saying you know um if you succeed at it you're gonna see the same thing yeah rather than it saying well this is my perspective yeah you can do an inner self-discovery quest and see if it matches up with with you yeah. of course that's not what it is you're being no. told what you're if, going to experience if you turn up at a meeting and say actually i i, I found something completely different then the then the, the the guru figure might say okay good right and then move on that, that's the best case scenario but worst case as well you haven't really so you haven't gone deep enough yet and yeah by the way this is this happens in other spheres it's not just spiritual sure. worlds i think any you can yeah. in any way find like you're trying to find a, a way to make money or train as a therapist or like there's a whole kind of um i just think wherever you find that like somebody acting as though they've got the real truth it's just that duality of truth and ignorance like your knowledge is not real knowledge it's just ignorance my knowledge is real knowledge and as you say it's sort of um it's kind of scary in a way it's saying this thing that we're talking about whether it's life or consciousness or self or whatever the object is that we're kind of discussing or the thing um that there's only one view on it and it's my view and I'm right and whatever you've got to say about it is not right until it matches mine and that's yeah like obviously a very arrogant position to take right it's even amazing. though I was right there <laughs> right there like 15 years ago same, um, same as well it's yeah. like we've come a long way <laughs> but it is fundamentalism you know that's precisely what it is it's really not that different i didn't realize until later like oh this is very similar to religious authoritarianism um but it's true yeah. there's a lot of distinction made it's often said like well this is not religion because in religion you've got this kind of like strict beliefs that you have to adhere to it's right there it's just right there. in a way it's like i was talking about this with someone the other day it's almost it's sort of it's sort of presented as less oppressive because you don't have all of the kind of the, the doctrine and the creed supposedly or the especially in the kind of radical non jazzy you would have you won't have the candles and the flowers and the drapes and the pictures and um you don't have such a fixed kind of organization as religion but that those bits aren't particularly relevant to the oppressive bit the oppressive bit is the person saying you're asleep, you're deluded, you're confused, or confusion is the case if you want to leave the people out of it. Whereas true seeing is over here. That's a crazy place to get to, I think. And that's as present there as anywhere else. So in a way, this kind of, um, this sort of claiming that this is very un unadorned and very raw and, and mm -hmm. free, and it doesn't have all of that, that kind of clutter from religion, it's, it's not true. And absolutely, those claims are beliefs it's just their beliefs on the one hand that are so strongly held by the people who say them they really feel they have real impact on your psyche and they feel like truth mm -hmm. or they, they present them as truth um and i was going to say another point about them they probably have such an impact that even saying them like like uh, does that no and that's the other thing is that they're, they're kind of their beliefs or tenets that are they say dressed up as non-beliefs as just truth yeah. but that also have a big impact on how you perceive things so you go oh well my perception now matches what's being said so that yeah. kind of verifies it but that's not a coincidence it's because you've been like had this dictated at you that you know our senses are very much plugged into our to our thoughts um so you start to see what you're told to see you know it's right it's and, and I think what gets characterized as awakening in that context is somebody who's completely like subordinated to that and like completely morphed into that. And it feels wonderful because you're free from, 
free from this pesky self that keeps having its own kind of sense of things and its own kind of um, keeps objecting to being told how to see things and that's gone suddenly it's massively suppressed and there's just this kind of pristine prison pristine prison well you and I talked about I think you said it it was sort of like exchanging one prison for another prison um, yeah because, you know that pristine sort of boundlessness and pure consciousness as we said like that can be for some people you know it can be years where that's yeah. still mainly experienced as liberation until you then have um, you know start to see some some of the limitations of that but I, I wanted to say because I feel like it is a really important it's been coming up a lot in conversations is that um, when you have this experience of let's say the dropping away of your sense of self there is you know that feeling of oh I got it this is what they're talking about there is no self but I think a lot of us still struggle with accepting this the notion that your preconceived notions about what that experience will mean affects that yeah so I thought to myself and curious what you think or other people is let's say before I had had my big sort of ego drop experience if I had been told like look what you are is more than just a separate self in an ego and when this you're gonna have this experience or if you have this experience where your sense of self and it falls away and you're open to this other dimension of reality um, that's not the be all end all either that's right that's like the other half of the picture there's the personal and then there's this more universal or impersonal but you're not gonna stop there you're gonna keep going and integrate that back together so that the self is still there it's still real but it's not it's not all of what's real right like it's part of something greater if I had been told that, how would that have affected the whole trajectory of my awakening path and of my even direct experience? How do you think it would have affected? I mean, I think it would have it would have been. Um, I, I wish that that had been the case, you know, because I wouldn't have had these notions of needing to, you know, when the self comes back online, that I need to then, um, you know, sort of fight against it or look down on that or feel, you know, like this is just, yeah, that this is an illusion that needs to be gotten rid of. Yeah, I think I think we, we've kind of talked about this before. But I think I possibly go sort of even further than you in that direction, and I I appreciate that you you know. I like your position because it's very like it's very inclusive, yeah. but I may, maybe just because I need to lean on this side more because especially with the people I'm working with and yeah. myself, I need to really like be an advocate of of people's kind of personal kind of power and intelligence and creativity, which absolutely gets shut out by the view that everything's already decided and it already yeah. is and there's no nothing nothing you can do. Um, and I, what what strikes me is that like when I first had a kind of like a kind of adult spiritual kind of experience. It was just through kind of meditation and it was really blissful and lovely. And I had, at this point, I hadn't heard of the word non-duality, let alone the whole kind of scene. Um, and if I think about it, it was, in a sense, it was very personal because it was, it was in a way I was like, I, I guess I'd grown up in a world which had kind of shaped how I saw myself. And then that was kind of unquestioned. And then in this experience, it was a kind of a somehow finding a way to to kind of di like let go of that and and to, to really start to feel myself and feel reality and see myself in my own way rather than a way that I just kind of inherited. And I think I think that the sad thing is that people often you know they'll they'll have their own experience and there's like a million experiences so. I'm not trying to make this some kind of special cherished experience you have to have. It was just something that happened to me that was kind of very powerful and, and nice. Um, but I think it was an experience of me trusting my own sense of things. So mm -hmm. ironically, then I was looking around, I guess that's a no people often do that. You, you have this novel thing happen and you kind of want to, somebody else to tell you what it means or somebody else to kind of, you know, yeah. tell you what that's all about. And that's, I think, where I then, 
that's kind of sad in a way that people go that way because actually what it is is a, a big opening up of their own sense of like how they see the how they see things how they sense reality how they feel in themselves and that's I think it's very personal and I think nobody else has special expertise on that topic they have their yeah. own sense but if they're presenting this kind of like all size fits all kind of doctrine then then in a way you're taking that away from them again yeah um and definitely when I work with people I'm not interested in them taking on my ideas or my perception I'm just interested in staying with whatever they're seeing and it might be completely secular we might never talk about spirituality and it and it might be it's just it's just like I think that when people really kind of trust their own perception of things it's quite first of all that's quite a scary thing to do because then you've got nothing to fall back on you're just like this is how I see things everybody might think I'm an idiot which is why that voice in your head says you know it's ridiculous don't say that but if you can you can gradually learn to do that uh, maybe with the help of somebody else like really like listening to you and anytime you kind of stop yourself just like inviting you to carry on because it's really interesting to hear someone talk from their own kind of being and their own sense um to me that's what like freedom looks looks like um so it's kind of shame that somehow that gets inverted into not existing, not being, it's all being dictated by this kind of, yeah, because I think it's it's a super personal thing to have this different kind of feeling or perception of things. Yeah. And you, so you're talking about people who come, come to you as a therapist, and some of them are people who have been down this path? Yeah, uh, yeah. Funnily enough, probably most of them, because... Um, I'm very lazy with it. Like, if I can avoid doing any kind of marketing or admin, I will, just because I'm really so much into listening and being and, like, flowing and kind of, you know, being creative and things. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. But it just means that people who've heard about me is usually from my non-dual past. Um, generally, people will have heard an interview here or there where, where they know that I've kind of moved away. So then they're kind of curious about that and then maybe they're in a kind of, you know, people are in different states. Sometimes they're still very much kind of immersed in non-duality. Sometimes they're very much wanting to get out. Sometimes they're kind of unsure. Um, but yeah, most most people are, are from that background. You Even though I've tried, like my, my therapy training is just completely like just normal secular training, uh, slightly yeah. more interesting, a bit more esoteric kind of body kind of training. But um uh, yeah, it's not related to that scene. Um, but yeah, yeah. Wow, it just must be so fascinating to see people at all these different different stages, and especially anybody who might be coming hoping for um, hoping for more of the neo advaita message. That those ones don't tend to last very long because it's very right. clear. Like I, people like, as I say, like waving my book and saying, "Do you still think this?" And, I just have to say, no, I, I don't. And, uh, like, I, I don't, you know, I feel bad that that's where they're at and that, and that's fine. And as I say, yeah. I meant to stay at the start, you know, like, it's just a kind of, um, as a kind of, like, a disclaimer. I, it would be completely inconsistent with what I'm saying to say that how I see things is true. You must believe it. I don't think that. I don't think we have this kind of um, absolute lens on reality. I think yeah. we have our own sense of things. And... Uh, but what I noticed in the non-duality -dual scene is there's a real monopoly on this is as it is. And there's very few critics, which I always, I feel like slightly scary, has a slightly totalitarian feel about it. So yeah. the fact that you and me and others are saying, well, actually, all is not as it seems from our perspective is a good thing because otherwise yeah. there's nowhere to look. If you do start to feel, I feel a bit isolated. I feel a bit lost. I feel a bit dead and I feel like my friendships are kind of withering away this happens a lot I've lost all interest in anything that happens a lot and there, there are reasons that non-duality will give for that happening they will say you know it's part of whatever the desert you're in the lion's mouth all these kind of like uh, phrases that are used to kind of but uh, that could be more problematic because if actually it's no good for you which you and me genuinely think yeah um, that's a real problem if you've got no way out. So hopefully us talking about it, it gives people another kind of option. 
Um, but I think I've deviated from your from your question. It's like, I feel like we're, we're flowing, and I feel yeah. like. Um, but yeah, no, we were talking about therapy, and I had been yeah. I had been curious to hear from you a little bit about um, what you have found from your perspective. Uh -huh. So okay, so yeah, just to bring it back to, to people who come in who are kind of wanting whatever neo data Western non duality from me. I just need to kind of like level with them about it and say, look, this is how I see things. And usually it's such a clash with where they're at and it's so yeah. much not what they're expecting. Um, it doesn't tend to go very far. And again, that's fine. As I'm saying, like I have a, I have a democratic view. I don't put my view higher than theirs, but I, yeah. it's helpful to give a different perspective. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the ones that tend to last are people who are already like, experienced some real problems there and maybe seen some slightly um not sometimes very extremely kind of oppressive dynamics going on between the, the gurus which don't call themselves gurus but act like them and the seekers um and the, maybe they feel kind of quite deadened by it um is that like because i guess i'm curious what the what the patterns are of what people come in with who have been harmed by it. I mean, I know a lot of what I hear and what I experienced. Um, yeah. Well, you, I heard you talk about the depersonalization and the derealization, de which is logical, yet they're saying there's no there's no person, there's no self. Yeah. But it's it's just given as a mystical um, attainment rather than a, and I, like, I think, I think we've got to be careful about like pathologizing spirituality, right. but uh, to me, that there's just a logical thing there. And I, I always find it quite yeah. ironic that what non-duality refers to as realization, psychiatrists refer to as derealization. And it may not be exactly the same thing, but it might be actually, yeah. <laughs> it might be. Because it's seeing things as unreal, which is an interesting definition of realization. Very um, much so. And so generally in patterns, yeah, there's that, there's, there's that, there's, People often come very, get very separated from from friend, friendships because they can't really relate to their friends anymore. I mean, it's kind of anti-relational because there's no relationship in somebody dictating the truth of reality and you just kind of being ignorant and either taking it on board and becoming that or being nothing. Relationship it has to involve two people with their own kind of experience kind of talking with each other. And I think that goes out the window when you've got a kind of non-dual frame that you've taken on. Um, aside from the fact that people will often feel, um, yeah, everything just feels kind of meaningless and, uh, um, yeah, kind of pointless. What's the point? There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do, um, which, which can feel very blissful at times, like hooray yeah. as, as it is. And that's great. But as I've said, it's a kind of a chamber because, because nothing can kind of grow or happen there. Yeah. Um, and then I would say more than anything stands out to me is so often people have just like lost like things that they used to really like be interested by or care about or be passionate about or like their artwork or um, I don't know, that like a political thing or, or their sense of nature or their kind of empathy for people or animals or just anything to do with like juice really, like feeling and spirit and uh, struggling to name it but it's just that kind of passion i think is the best word like they've mm -hmm. lost the kind of passion and some people have come like the first person who came to me actually after i kind of gave an interview not as strongly along these lines as this interview but it was back then so it, it was where i was at like he'd really lost um and he really knew it he's like i've really lost this kind of passion for things that i used to care about and i just don't care and i hate that about myself um so that's that's a big one. People feeling really kind of yeah, lack of. I guess if I was trying to be more psychiatric about it, I'd say lack of motivation, depression, uh, sense of isolation. Th these kind of uh, terms. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, I've, I all of that. I mean, I can relate to all of that. I would say, like the way that I often thought about it was just like disengagement. Mm. and this feeling of um, feeling like I can't or don't want to participate in things, but then I, I wanted to, but then I felt like I couldn't mm. because I was so 
you know, I was so impersonalized. So I also had thought recently about the difference between depersonalization when it's more of like the pathological, more dysfunctional and like terrifying kind, and then the sort of blissful, enlightening or, um, you know, freeing kind of um, non-self. And so what I have felt is that all of the all of Neo Advaita is impersonal, right? So it's like there's always impersonalization. And then that the impersonalization can slip into depersonalization. And that I think it's a, it well, it is a fine line. And I think people, the same person will go back and forth between them. Uh huh. Has been kind of what I've seen. It's quite a neat way to sort of create a bit of kind of a distinction, but also like to bring them into relationship to each other. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder because you mentioned a few times about the kind of the bliss of it, and I feel like it's important to bring that up just to kind of show that we do know that side of it. People might be saying, "Oh, they're just like they're just in the desert, or they're just I don't know what what, yeah. what how people will rationalize this, but it definitely will happen." Um, but I think that, that you know I've talked particularly about the kind of dictatorial kind of um, narrative of non-duality or discourse of non-duality. You know, there's talking in very global terms, like black and white terms. This is truth, and that's a load of ignorance, and this is how it is, and then, you know. But there's also this kind of other narrative, kind of like mixed in, which is a kind of more um, like evocative language. So when you talk about oneness, unconditional love, childlike wonder, um, it's a much more kind of poetic language, and I think that really speaks to a, a sort of what I'd almost call like pre pre duality, like a kind of a, a kind of an early kind of infant-like state, um, which is very pleasurable to return to. Um, I think it's one of the reasons like babies are quite nice to be around is that they've got this kind of lovely kind of aura about them. Um, and I, I think I think there's some value in going there, but I think it's problematic when you see that as the whole truth. So I, I think what's going on with small children is that they they kind of need to see reality as as this kind of oneness that's just kind of there for them, that's like just this kind of love that's that's all, all all there for them. And you can see with children as well that they're very allergic to the to the reality that their parents actually have their own lives and agendas and lived existed before they were born, and that's really scary and disturbing. And children just don't want to hear that. And I think it's I think it's um, not like they're little narcissists and like not interested. I think it's because it's it's terrifying because it means that they could walk away. They could, you know, your parents could or your carers or whatever could could leave you because there's an elsewhere and they have they're not here just for you. So I think it makes life easier if you can just see them as you're just here for me and you'll play with me for eternity and you'll be interested in whatever I'm interested in. You can really feel it. I, I, I think you've mentioned that you kind of look after children sometimes and yeah. I've got a, you know a, a young daughter and they really like they're really desperate for you to be fully involved with whatever they're doing and you you can't bring any of your own agenda in exactly and it's really sweet because you can get it and you can see the vulnerability there they're dependent on you and they, they kind of need to feel like you're just there for them you don't have another life yeah yeah and so I think when we kind of regress back to that it's really lovely and I do think that's a normal part of humanity you know you go for a swim in the sea or a walk in the forest or you can rest your head on someone's shoulder you have a bath you're just kind of melting into this lovely sense of being held yeah. and I do I mean this is probably where you would talk about the both and but it's like I do think there's there's some truth in that that we are kind of in this reality and we're kind of embedded by it but I think the bit of it which is and I think any perception has things that are in focus and things that are obscured the bit that's obscured is that people do have their own minds, they do have their own lives, they do have, they do go else, there is an elsewhere. And children need to, I think, learn this very gradually, otherwise it's um, too shocking for them. They need to gradually realise, oh, actually, other children that I'm playing with might want to play their own thing, and that, that's really yeah. distressing to start with. Um, and I, I think I think non-duality kind of encourages you to just kind of regress back to that oneness and see that as see that as the truth. And I think that explains why there's such an astonishing lack of empathy often in the way that um, particularly radical non-dualists kind of conduct themselves. It's a real like I don't want to hear about any of your problems. I'm not interested in you. Just shut up. 
listen to me. It's that kind of attitude, you know? Yeah. And it's repackaged as compassion very perversely, like in an Orwellian kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Department of War is called the Department of Peace. It's like <laughs> brutal lack of interest or empathy in anybody oh. else is, is packaged as true compassion. Um, I think that's where that comes from. Like children do not want to know about other people's existence because it's very scary to them. Mm. Um, and I do think there's an element of kind of regressing back to that in, um, and it's always an option. Children do it, they grow up a bit and then they go back. But I think to have a real, a really kind of like satisfying free um, experience of, of life, you need to be open to other people's completely different like perception of things. Sure. And that's where conversations start to get interesting. They're really dull if it's just one person holding forth about the nature of reality and the other person sitting at their feet, you know, it's kind yeah. of... <laughs> well said. Well, what you're saying about the, like, the childlike regression is something I'm really fascinated by because there is, there does tend to be that sort of, like, over-romanticization, is that a word, of, yeah. of that of childhood, let's say, when before there was a sense of a me and a you and before, you know, the mind came in and said things have to be this way or that way. Um, but the thing that I, what we see a lot is that it's almost like a return to like pre-developmental stages where it's pre-individuation, it's pre, um, you know, healthy ego development um, where see if I can stay on the thread that I'm that I started here um right that if you if you are to say there like a radical non-dualism doesn't necessarily even say that like separation is relative it doesn't exist there is no individual that turns into something that can become insanity right yeah. because we developed a sense of individuation to know where I end and you yeah. begin yeah. and so if they take it really to that collapsing all of that back into, you know, the just swimming in the soup of oneness, like you said, with no distinctions versus if you're able to um, maintain your adulthood and your sense of boundaries and individuation. But then, like we said before, like have that both and, which for me is like that we're separate. We're also not separate, but that's a really important part of why it seems like I think a lot of these people are, they're talking about sort of like, um, some people have described it as like the Peter Pan syndrome, you know, not wanting to grow up when, you know, everything was so, seemed so perfect back then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely makes sense. I remember again, like just had a little like a memory back to that first book that was very much kind of uh, you know, in that, that kind of non-dual uh, scene. Forward by Tony Parsons, I remember you. <laughs> like, yeah. Just to say, it's very, very much in that in that kind of way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was a piece about like, how did I describe it? It was like, it was it was like a poem, like a not 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 very sophisticated, poem, but like just it was something like out in the morning air, hanging up, washing for Granny, when suddenly I'm aware this is all happening for me. And it was like, and then it kind of goes on from that, and it was like describing the trees and the birds and the air. It's all kind of there just for me. And that's a really lovely feeling. And often you, you see something like this in people's accounts of awakening and they're walking in. It's often in nature. And I do think nature gives you that yeah. kind of embedded sense. It does kind of take you back to that, you know, walking in a, in a park or just kind of outside. And then suddenly the sense that everything is kind of just this kind of love everywhere and that other pe the essence of other people is, is actually me. There's something beautiful about it, but there's something very scary about it because you're kind of erasing difference. You're erasing, um, you're, you're erasing difference. And I, and I think, I think it's fine as long as you know what it is, as long as you know that it is a kind of regressive state. The last thing you want to do when you're kind of just relaxing or sunbathing or whatever is empathize with other people. You're just kind of with yourself. You're just melting and, and um, but if you say, and this is the true nature of reality, this is the whole truth, then you're, you're kind of excluding other people, their perceptions, their, their lives. And uh, that's yeah. such a shame because then you're missing out on one of the biggest kind of spiritual satisfactions, which is, or you can call it spiritual if you like or not, but it's listening to somebody else and then responding from yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that's such an alive thing. I just feel like, to me now, that almost feels like the best thing. 
Um, I do re don't get me wrong. I do really like just like melting and being, but but actually listening to somebody and and valuing what they're saying as as completely uh, valid as anything that I can think, but likewise val you know valuing what I see and just it being really mysterious. Like you really um, you don't know what you're going to talk about in advance, and you don't know where it's going to go, and you're just going to you're making sense of things as you go, kind of back and forth. It's such a kind of vibrant and open and free thing and I think you missed well, I mean definitely there, there was no hope of that when I was writing my book and I was in that in that right. place and it's yeah. and, you, and you're isolated and it's it's yeah. weird to feel like uh, a prison is heaven actually hmm. or what um, was heaven I was just like trapped in heaven in a weird yeah. way um, yeah. no I can really relate to that but I love like that feeling or like that newfound feeling that you're expressing of just like the joy and the delight and the immersion in conversation and getting to know people because that was something that I just totally lost. Like yeah. I was just so indifferent, like conversation was meaningless. It was exhausting to even like be conversant and also who's there to converse, right? It was like Exactly and everything's already decided and solved and you already it's already known. It's over, you know? It's so yeah. ironic that there's so much talk about mystery and not knowing, and yet it's absolutely everything is dictated. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I really think this is unknown. Like, and uh, but again, that, that I feel like that becomes another prison. Like, it has to be unknown. You can't know anything about it. Actually, I feel like um, whatever we're talking about, we we see it from different sides, uh, and and we're sharing that, and maybe we glimpse another side of it. But it's always, it's never like fully kind of grasped and known and I think that's so freeing um, yeah yeah it's been it's been freeing for me to over the last few years start to appreciate even the conceptual level of reality as real and as something that I want to explore because it's it's also wondrous you know in the in the past it was just that that level of reality had no meaning because it wasn't essentially real right which so mean that, the conceptual level you, you mean just like like concepts and thinking things through and, and yeah, having conversations, yeah. the imagination, sharing stories, you know, yeah. having questions about things, describing things together. Yeah. It's so rich yeah. and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Life well, once really you impoverished without that, but once this you, funny, once I you... remember yet another passage from, from the book, which yeah. I now strongly disagree with. And it was something like getting to know someone is such a, or such a chore or something and that's really in line with that it was just I mean it's slightly complicated because it's not like I can't like before before I got into non-duality I was really free and happy and easy in life I wasn't I was otherwise it wouldn't have be, appealed to me um, mm -hmm. so probably getting to know people was quite hard then um, now I really enjoy it I mean I Definitely, it's like if I think of like a first therapy session, that's always the hardest session for me because I don't know anything about them. They don't know anything about me. There's this a bit of like nervousness in the air, and uh, usually after the session, I've got all these weird feelings. And I've got no idea where they come from or what they mean because I don't, haven't got there yet. But usually, with a session or two down the line, I'm sort of, um, you know, I. I I, I've got a basic idea of it, and somehow that already means that I don't need to be kind of processing it in such a kind of bodily way or such a kind of like a negative bodily way. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's just really sad if people lose that because that kind of like intimacy of being like really, uh, really listening to somebody and responding to them authentically is, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I found that. And I think a lot of people do. It's like when you lose that vibrance and that interest in some yeah. of the things that you once saw were just mundane and meaningless to then return to it, having lost it, there's like that wow factor now that like you lost it. Maybe you thought that you'll never be able to get it back again. And now that you have, it's like you bring this whole new sense of appreciation to the things that you once rejected. It's really lovely to hear, by the way, Jess, because I hear that's, that was how it was for you. And, yeah. I, and I, I've seen that over and over again, like working with people that like real, and it's so lovely to see. And actually, um, just in terms of how I work, that's the main thing that I'm doing as I, as I kind of, when people talk to me, sometimes what they're talking about has like a real passion and life to it. Yeah. And whenever that comes, I'm like all over it. I'm like, 
wow, I want to hear more. And unfortunately, a lot of what people do, and this is outside of non-duality too, but it gets massively amplified in non-duality, is they sort of, they start to share something a bit that's like their own thought and their own perspective or, and it's really vibrant. And then they, they completely like overrule themselves and say, wow. oh yeah, it's, it's just ridiculous. No, it's just, and then if they've got a non-dual background, they'll also say, oh, it's, oh, it's just a story or it's, it's, just, yeah. uh, it's, just, it's just thoughts or something. And, and so, so just my work, whether I'm working with non-duality people or just anybody, it's, it's, it's just noticing that kind of real kind of spirited interest, like mm -hmm. care, kind of artistry. I remember one person I was working with, he was like, he really wanted to like do, like he just couldn't, this is not a non-dual person, like he never heard of non-duality, but he just felt like he wasn't quite there, interestingly, and he, uh, he really felt like he should be interested in something in life, but everything just felt like a hobby. Like he didn't, there's nothing that felt like passionate that he'd go like, oh yeah, yeah. I can do this. Um, and I care about this. But it was weird, like in spite of himself, he'd like talk about something political and you could really hear that he cared about it. And I, and I would say like, you can really hear that you care about that. And he'd be like, yeah, 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 but I don't really. And it, oh. and it's interesting, like this kind of short circuiting of yourself, or maybe that's yeah. not the right word, but this kind of, yeah. But then at some uh, one um, on one occasion he was just kind of leaving the building after after a session and he's like suddenly had this thing came in his mind and he'd written it in his phone and he came back and he was he just read it to me next you know next week and you know you could tell he'd already psyched himself up I'm going to share this incredibly embarrassing like poem or whatever it was he'd written like little piece yeah. and I I can't remember the content and I'm not even sure I particularly heard the content but what he was saying it just felt three-dimensional it almost like it just came out of me it was so because it was just really from him and of him and it wasn't yeah. like him trying to work out how to yeah do things or how to it just like came from in him so I, yeah I think I know you're interested in like embodiment how do you because people get very disembodied with non-duality no wonder if you keep hearing you're not the body the body's just an appearance you know there's no inside and outside well goodbye to any sense of embodiment um so if people uh so yeah just like looking for that kind of like that passion any passion or feeling or desire i think it's all the same kind of thing um it's there thankfully i've never met anybody where it's just completely dead and out and there's nothing mm -hmm. left it's mm -hmm. there it's as alive as ever it's just really squashed down and and yeah. as i say there's all this second guessing that kind of overrules themselves so it's just like staying with that being really fascinated relating to it as an equal not as a well done you're doing great one day you're going to get yeah. to my my level but just that's super interesting i really want to know more what what do you got to say about it i'm you know yeah. um and it brings people's you know passionate in all you know all, in a very organic way i don't need to like people don't need to like you know just tune into their body in a, such a conscious way um i can do that but it generally i'd, I'd rather it be very organic because i feel like mm -hmm. that's embodied you know our bodies are very kind of involuntary yeah. sort of like not involuntary i think that's misleading but they're very spontaneous and so that's if i can work in that way i that's what i try to do rather than imposing something else on them like okay we're gonna sit here and tune into your I body um, okay it's much more just kind of free flowing it's free flowing but it's really looking for any kind of like affect or feeling which you know for me feeling is a very embodied thing you know if you if you're upset you know tears go to your eyes your face changes color the feeling is all here so mm -hmm. if you can just see that and hear that in people's voice and the more you listen to it the more you will you will and you just really respond with a kind of you know natural you know i'm not trying to do it i just find it really moving and exciting if somebody is passionate about something um yeah. that brings them back to their kind of body and their life and their interest in things and um or if they haven't been there before, which was a bit my case, kind of, I didn't really found that much to be passionate about before. And I guess I was a little bit like that client I mentioned. It brings people into that. So whether, yeah, whether you've had a non-dual background or not, or whether you've you've been there or not, it's just, it's really fascinating how that is in, as far as I, I've come across, it's, it's in there in anybody. And often people don't know it, or they've just so like, kind of beaten it down that they, they just, yeah don't notice it anymore yeah i imagine that it has a lot of like there's a lot of need to to validate 
or give people almost like give them permission to give themselves permission to engage in those things like whether it's self whatever kind of self-expression that they sort of had that Right, like you said, that inner internalized gaslighting of oh, that's yeah. just the ego's desire to be important or to be special. Yeah. Um, it's meaningless. To, it's yeah, like the validation. Of thing. It's got nothing, no relevance. Yeah, no yeah. To just say that you know, wow, that that matters. That matters yeah. to you. Like how awesome. Yeah. That's another way, actually, that I think about working with people in an embodied way without it necessarily involving you know like touch or exercises or. Um, sort of this phrase I came up with like what matters matters so that if there is this kind of like with this guy reading out from his phone it was like somehow the words that he was saying had become this physical thing between us it like materialized in the room yeah well I knew that it mattered to him I mean and I could just feel it it was obviously he'd he'd gone and typed it and he did it but I didn't need to work that out it was just yeah so I feel like if something matters to you it becomes more vivid I'm just thinking of again somebody I worked with recently and they it was very clear to them, like whenever they're, whenever they're sort of like in touch with what they kind of want, which is, you know, a very bodily thing, isn't it? It's like what you're drawn to, what, what, which way do you want to go, even if it's a little bit more long term yeah. as well as immediate. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's a material thing and it's what matters to you. So it's like the word matter kind of pivots really nicely there, I think, to kind of tie body and mind together. It does. Yeah. Wow. Well, this is maybe taking it in another direction and we'll see what, how you feel about this, but I'm wondering because one of the, and you touched on it a bit before is one of the things that's been coming up a lot that I've been hearing is people who are of more of like the Neo Advaita or radical non-dualism persuasion seem to kind of dismiss if somebody expresses that they were harmed or other people were harmed by um, their involvement with, let's say, just like the self-negation teachings, that means that they only understood things conceptually and didn't actually have a quote-unquote direct experience. Um, and for me, and I want to hear what you have to say about it, is that it almost seems like the people who do have the direct experience are likely more, more likely to be harmed by it because it does take so much more of an effect on your soul and your, you know, your mind body systems. So just curious what your yeah, take Yeah, I mean, that. that absolutely, that absolutely, um, that makes absolute sense. But the problem is also you're less likely to know that something kind of bad's going on because you've, you've yeah. you, this thing has happened and it's something that you've been told to celebrate and at times at least feels incredible. Um, and you're told that even though it feels horrible, that's that's enlightenment too, because everything's included, uh, which is a scary state again. You're just saying that everything is acceptable and to be accepted, and you know, then you're kind of endlessly trapped in something. Um, but also something I wanted to say about that, like more about like that people kind of responding in that way is, yeah, it makes sense to me that they would, because to me that's the whole duality that I think is at the heart of kind of Western non-duality paradoxically yeah. that, that they're, that, you know, they're completely wiped out. You, you're no longer a speaking person like, oh, she's whatever. She's, she yeah. has some emotional distress in her life. Like that doesn't apply to everybody or, she, you know, and she's actually talked about it. Um, that's, you know, there's certainly generations of people alive who that's a real stigma. So if you do that, they're already like, oh, snowflake or whatever i'm not going to listen to you that's right um but again it, like for me it, it comes back down to do you take a point of view that whatever anybody like anybody says something it's valid and you can listen to them or do you have this kind of create this hierarchy of oh there's damaged people over there and i'm a non-damaged person and of course and all people who are just living in concepts and they don't get it and we really get it you've created a massive duality there and that's a scary thing because you've completely reduced some people to a kind of subhuman level and you've elevated yourself to a kind of a demigod level or whatever. And right. I just think um, any any sign of that is a problem, um, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely, completely agree with you. It's really been interesting to see the ways that people have responded to more people spreading awareness. Um, about you know 
the limitations and the ways that a lot of people are harmed is a yeah. it's very telling it's very telling yeah yeah it's quite culty because that's what cults do if somebody comes in with a criticism or with a different perspective you're out you know you're kind of out in the cold yeah yeah um i mean yeah, and they kind of use the they use the teachings to dismiss you. So of course you know that yeah. there's nobody there anyway, and that kind of thing. Um, and then there's nothing you can say. Like it doesn't matter what you say. Of course, it just, just shuts down. Here, blah 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 That's blah 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 because you've ceased to count in terms of. Right, 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 right. Yeah, but it's mostly I would say it's just like the the most glaring thing is just the lack of empathy. Yeah. You know, instead of it being like, oh, wow, there are people that can be harmed by elements of this. We should care about that. It's instead yeah. of, sort of it's trying like, to. Like it's very like political parties do this a lot, don't they? And it always looks bad because it is really bad. Just like doubling down on like, you know. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. I've lost my thread a bit, but, you know, it's, it's okay. yeah, it's. You can go two ways when somebody I think that's true in any case you can you can go two ways where somebody kind of shares something you can you can relate to it you can say oh yeah actually i can relate to that feeling or that perspective or you can go oh my god look at her or look at him you can kind of like what's the opposite of relating just like um you kind of just like yeah you just like turn kind of debase the person you just say that's baseless and it's and i feel like comedy is quite like that there's been like an interesting kind of tie-in i think between um, non-duality on the one hand and kind of like new atheism on the other hand and they both tend to have this kind of very like contemptuous kind of stance of like that's a load of nonsense this is truth funnily enough given that one is saying there's only matter and the other one's saying there's only consciousness you can see the big kind of split there the kind of black and white thinking very much yeah um, but I was just thinking about it because also like there's comedians who have got very kind of like involved in that and you have know, like Ricky Gervais who's kind of big on his atheism mm -hmm. and it's kind of contempt for anything um and and I was just thinking about like humor like because there's, there's a humor where you can you kind of like isolate a particular group of people or a particular opinion and everybody's kind of laughing at that yes which is yes. very dualistic like you're up here and they're down there and yeah. look at those stupid people oh yeah and there's there's one where the joke comes across where I'm thinking of particularly like a self-deprecating kind of humor where you kind of like the jokes kind of on you, but the point of the joke is not to laugh at the stupid comedian on stage, but it's, you can relate. They're saying yeah. something that you would yeah. never in your life say. And actually yeah. you're like, yeah, that's me. Like most days yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yes. And so I feel like whether we're talking comedy or whether we're just talking spirituality or therapy or just everyday relating, you can relate to what somebody says, or you can like push it down in the, ill stupid you know yeah yeah based category and and separate yourself and in a sense that's what the non what you're doing in non-duality because suddenly you're in you're in heaven or you're enlightened and everybody else is in the dark so i guess at right. least they're consistent <laughs> yes in their lack of empathy and um, right and i guess we've been there so i guess we need to we, we kind of can understand Definitely. It's not particularly nice to be on the receiving end of. Definitely not. But it is very, again, it's very telling. And so I feel like it's, it's helpful to me just to be able to, to see that what I'm, what I'm spreading awareness about is very much active and alive and happening. And it's um, so good that you're doing it and that you've, that you've taken the, that you're, you're going for it because I, I've, I've been for a long time sort of, these have been my thoughts about it. I've put stuff on my website ages ago that I think hardly anybody knows exists and uh, been working with people like privately and, and kind of helping them and, you know, having a real kind of conviction about what I'm doing. Um, but I've never like had that kind of like, right, I'm just going to go out here and really like say this. And I think possibly partly because I would felt in a weird position on the, you know, yesterday I'm talking about, yes, this is the nature of reality. And now I'm saying actually, Sorry, I know you've already bought my book and whatever and immersed yourself in this world, but I, I, I'm on a completely different page. And I, also, I was very young when I got involved with it, so I think I just wanted to get away from it, you know. 
it's quite embarrassing to write a book in your early 20s. I would kind of <laughs> recommend people consider not doing unless they yeah. really, really have thought about things a lot, which some especially if it's about old are very, very good. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I just, uh, I, I just kind of wanted to get away from it really and then help people individually and just not be involved. And I really, I think it's of so much value of you just kind of stepping forward and knowing that you're going to get attacked as you have been already and doing it and i'm really really glad that you reached out and that i'm part of it Me um, too. <laughs> yeah it's a, there's a lot of a lot of co collaboration because that's it's for me very much about sort of like gathering up you know all different types of people that have been affected by it yeah whether it's individuals who experience it or psychotherapists um or family members of people who were involved in it. There's just so many people whose lives are touched by it. Yeah. Yes, we know in some positive ways, but yeah. you know the the harmful side is what's not reached the light enough. So that's it. It's, and it's also being able to connect with other people like yourself who have experienced it. It it gives me more of a sense of like safety in in doing it and reassurance that you know I'm not. Yeah, you know, because that self gaslighting is very built in, isn't it? So it's very easy. Like, like I, I don't get anywhere near there, there, there now, but I, 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 I know how like sticky that is, that thing, because it's, yeah. I feel like in a way it's a sort of like, a, there's a real, it's almost like a turbo charging that kind of inner troll because <laughs> the, like the inner troll already says things like, oh, you're stupid. I can't believe you said that. Like what, like yeah. don't say that, or that's ridiculous. Or it's always kind of like thwarting our kind of like inner intelligence and creativity and like you can't wear that and you can't like look like that and you can't yep. really express that view because it's but i think that when that kicks in actually that's the most valuable thing you have to say or share and it knows mm -hmm. it and it knows you then you're totally vulnerable because it's really yours and you're really mm -hmm. putting it out there and then non-duality comes in and and it is no longer not just it's not just saying that particular idea is ridiculous or that particular whatever t-shirt you're wearing is 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 crazy it's it's like every thought you could possibly have every sense you have is nonsensical it's nothing so it's it kind of turbocharges that inner troll and then sense the self is just like completely wiped out in a way although it's still there like in a coffin <laughs> somewhere in your your recesses and then you've got this troll which is why i think um there's a kind of real confidence that, oh, you've just got this one who goes around like telling everybody, this is it, this is the nature of reality. Like, yeah. It sort of feels good, but it's completely, um, I don't know, unhinged. <laughs> like, yeah. in, in my view, in my view, in my experience. It's got, like a, it's got a grip on, on, your, on your reality and on your, your free, free thinking and free expression. That's like cool. I liked you and I talked about it being sort of like an internalized, the internalized gaslighter, sorry, but Cat. I need to let out the door. Um, oh, that was so, a cat. I thought it was a baby. No, <laughs> no baby. Let the baby crawl out. <laughs> um, no, the last thing I was just saying was um, like that you have that internalized like Neo Advaita guru who's now like inside your head yeah. being like, that's egoic. That's a story, you know? Yeah. So I found that like in my own case, I remember I really had to like let myself kind of like rage at that because it has so much power. It's like God, like a God versus a human. Like you, what chance has got to sit, like, because I think of what's the personal sense of things. It's a very kind of like subtle felt carefully piecing together in the progress of being created thing versus this one from on high saying that's a load of bullshit. This is reality. That's crap. Uh, yes. It's hard. Like if you were, if you're having a conversation with somebody, it'd be really hard to maintain that in the face of somebody just like going, "What are you talking about?" And you have dinner parties that are like that. If the wrong people are invited, you know, somebody say, "No, no, that's a load of nonsense. That's never going to happen," or, or whatever. So you've got that in your head, and um, that. So that's the flip side of like really staying with people's own sense of things. Is, yeah. is kind of helping them to kind of become aware of that thing. Sometimes people are already very aware of it. Like the first person again who came to talk to me about it was like, but I've just got these gurus in my head that just keep saying these things to me and it just wipes out any yeah. Um, yeah. any kind of like creative thing or, or, or anything that I want to do. It's just, it wipes it out every time. But other people, they're not so aware of it and, and 
they find it really helpful to start to realize because suddenly that big figure is brought down to size. It's, it's just a thing and it's usually not a very intelligent point of view. It's a very unnuanced, you, that's ridiculous. You know, it's just, it's like a global statement versus what people were already kind of thinking or feeling before, which is usually really intelligent and interesting. Mm. Yes. That was one of, I think that was the first thing where I really started to, and that's why, so my second book was called Mystery Not Mastery, and as I say, it's still very much Neo Advaita, but it was, and I was already starting to be aware of this contradiction, that there was a lot of talk about not knowing, and this is a mystery, mm -hmm. and then there was this, like, dictating everything, this is the nature of reality, and you, and self, and I'm absolutely exactly. sure about this, there's no me here, I'm that certain, it's like, it's just, this is the word of God, was effectively what was being said. Right, right, right. And I was in that headspace, and then I started to feel there's something really off about this. Yeah. Um, I'm reducing everybody to nothing, really, everybody else, and I've actually reduced myself to nothing. Right. And people are so intelligent and thoughtful when you give them half a chance. It doesn't matter what their background or their age as well. Like, toddlers, they're so thoughtful. And, like, you know, their intelligence is the same in my, in my view. It's just, yeah. Yeah. But, of course, you have to... You have to grant those people their reality in order to to see that to see them as interesting and exactly precious. exactly so. and kind of get off your your mountain top of really being sure that you know you you know it or knowingness knows it or or whatever. Right. And it's such a relief though to be um, just to be amongst equals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to. And it's so freeing because you're getting rid of you're getting rid of the, the guru, like you're killing the guru. Maybe that's what's meant by, if you meet Buddha on the road, kill him. It just means if somebody else is there to try and tell you anything, then yeah, it's it's interesting to hear what somebody else has to say, but it's not interesting to be told this is the truth. It's yeah. interesting to say, this is how I see it. That's mm. cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least that's how I feel now. It is just so fascinating because at the same time, we have that human drive to to have someone tell us the way it is, but yeah, yeah it's, Where um, that comes from that kind of, yeah, it might be, I, I would think that it kind of comes from, I feel like when we're, we're small, we kind of need the function of like a parent or a carer is to kind of, yeah. just to kind of be around us and kind of listen to us and try and be patient with us. And, uh, mm -hmm. kind of in the absence of that, unfortunately, Maybe the majority of people don't get enough of that. That's right. I think maybe that's where the kind of inner tyrant comes from, is that you just need to kind of manage somehow. So you have this very simplistic, dominating kind of voice in your head saying, don't do that, do that. And whereas if yeah. you kind of get to be around people who are just like, oh, that's really interesting. What are you doing? And like, you know, they're doing some really random thing compared to an adult, but you're really getting where they're coming from and why that's interested them. Um, yeah, that just really allows people to kind of just develop their own thing and not conform and uh, yeah. feel good and accept other people doing the same. Um, so again, I guess that actually takes me to a very compassionate place of people who get very much into non-duality and, and even non-dual speakers as I was and as many people still out there are. And I've, I, I noticed that in people's biography as well. It does seem like there's quite a lot of absence of that. And then you're kind mm -hmm. of turning to this kind of looking for a kind of um, just easy, absolute, simple kind of thing that's going to make things better. Yeah, which sounds a lot like religion, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. So, yeah, it's all, it's all connected. It's universal themes, yeah. but a very, very specific dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Freedom, oh well, lack of freedom kind of dressed up as freedom. Very well said. Was there anything that you feel like you want to mention before we, I think we did a... No, I think that's good. We've covered everything. Yeah. We've, we've, um, we've done a non-duality. We've, we've, we've established the whole nature of everything and now, yes. now nobody needs to think for themselves. So. Right. Right. <laughs> And we're both wearing black, so so we've got our and tiny beige, bolts that people can background. join. And <laughs> <laughs> well, one of us is just a projection of the other one's mind. So. Oh, well, exactly. Let's not go down that 
But I, I do feel like overall, like you and I and what we've come to and what we hope to communicate to people is like that permission to just be fully human. Fully human and just follow your sense of things. And, and anytime someone starts to talk from, to claim a position of enlightenment or, or seeing or awakeness and implying yeah. your kind of sleepiness or just like yeah. get rid of it, that's, that's obviously oppressive. <laughs> Sorry, obviously it also sounds oppressive, but to my mind it's oppressive. Like why, why would you give somebody that power? Yeah, um, yeah. And why would like, you assume that yourself? You're going to like elevate yourself above everybody else. And that's actually a very lonely place to be. 